announcements? Yeah, they were pretty helpful. Six. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So as I promised at the start of the term, the way I've got this course broken down is into three separate chunks. We are done with the worst of the theory. Yay. So the theory part of this is done. Now we're getting into the practical side of the deal, which is SQL. Um, for those of you that have been bored out of your gourds up till now, because all you've heard is terminology and phrases and weird concepts, now you get to play and actually get to stir the computers to do something back to you. And my laptop's ignoring me. All right, so I'm going to do the introduction to SQL this week. I'm going to talk about something called DDL, and I'm going to teach a few basic commands. It's important that you read the PDFs that go hand in hand with this because there's a PDF that actually has syntax reference for you guys that goes with Unit 5 or Electrify, depending how you want to handle it. All right, number one. Uh, the history lesson, because there always has to be history. Why? It's important to know where you've been, or where things have been, to understand why they are the way they are now. SQL is a sp special purpose programming language. It's designed to do one thing. By contrast, you guys have been learning general purpose languages, such as Java. You can write pretty much anything in Java, within reason. SQL, on the other hand, is what they call a special purpose language. It has one job and only one job, and it's designed to do it really, really well. What's its job? It's to talk to a database server. It's not a glorious job, but it's a job. There are a few other special purpose languages out there. Uh, there's a language called R. If anybody here has ever studied stats, you may have come across a language called R. I don't even know what it looks like, but it is designed specifically for stats. That's its purpose in life. So, that's SQL. It was created by IBM in the early 70s. IBM came around and they talked to all their pocket protectors and said, guys, we've got to come up with a standardized way to talk to the database server. So then they got a bunch of pocket protectors, put them all in separate rooms and told them to do jobs without talking to each other. You'll understand what I mean by that soon enough. And we originally was called SQL. S-E-Q-U-E-L. Stood for Structured English Query Language. Thus, the stupid pronunciation that still lives on to this day is SQL as SQL. They had to change it to SQL because a company sued IBM. Somebody actually took it on themselves to sue IBM, and IBM blinked. The other company already had a trademark for 25 years on it. It was hard to say, yeah, we just, you know, they lost out on it. NVIDIA card. There we go. Now, SQL is an initialism. You know what an initialism is? It means you pronounce the letters, not the word. An acronym, you pronounce the word. It'd be like saying you're going to pronounce IBM as IBM. It's SQL. They ask a lot of people to call it SQL. Every time you say it, you sound like a doorknob. You're just not pronouncing it right. At least that's my opinion. But you know, there's other parts I call it SQL, so what am I supposed to say? The very first commercial version was released by Oracle. Version 2, on the VAX computers. This is really old. Um, VAX is really old. But, you know, it existed, it did the job. Yes? No, it's, I was being sarcastic. Basically, every command looks completely different. There is no standard way any command is written. So it's, it says if you had seven or eight guys sitting in separate rooms, they each had one job. Imagine if I took the seven people on the same row, told you guys, okay, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. You're not allowed to ask each other how you're planning to implement it. And then you're given a library to talk to the server. The language has nothing to do with how they talk to the server. That's a separate thing. That's just communication libraries. The actual language is like it was developed by a bunch of people in separate rooms. Um, the first standard was established in 1986. It was called SQL 86. Uh, in 99 is where the major standards, uh, the standard changed dramatically, and it is considered the de facto standard, SQL 99. 
It included recursion triggers and regex. Most of these words mean nothing to you guys. Uh, but you will learn about recursive functions eventually in your career. And you won't understand recursive functions until you understand recursive functions. It's just, that's how it is. Uh, regex, same thing. But these were all really big changes to the language. Up till then, the language had stayed pretty much static for years. Uh, in 2003, 2006, and 2008, they brought in XML, a language that nobody uses anymore. Uh, XML is a markup language similar to HTML. It's pretty much been abandoned for, uh, in favor of JSON. They also brought in, instead of, and they formalized a command called truncate, instead of as a trigger thing. They currently are sitting at SQL 2011. I couldn't tell you what's new in it. They output every four or five years, three or four years, there's a book that comes out, it's about 80 pages long, with things that they feel, that the standards body feels and database servers should be able to do. Or Oracle is sitting at 2003 standard, plus its own extensions. Postgres is somewhere between 2003 and 2008, plus its own extensions. MySQL is sitting in like 1984. Well, not quite being sarcastic, but it's actually lacking a lot of things. Okay, that's the history lesson done. SQL is a three-part affair. It's made up of three different, the language itself is made up of three separate pieces. And the three separate pieces have very distinct different jobs. The first one's known as the data definition language, known as the DDL. It's, you, it exists to create and maintain objects in the database. It has nothing to do with the data, it has to do with the structure. So you know how you guys have been happily diagramming? And in lab four, I had you, you know, synchronize. And if you looked at the file of generate, it had a bunch of commands in it. That's DDL. It defines the structure of the database. There's DML, the data manipulation language. Its purpose in life is to create and maintain data. It adds, updates, and deletes data. And then there's DCL. That one's a data control language. It's for security. We will not be touching on that at all in this course. Why? Because you can take an entire course dedicated to it. And every server implements it a little differently because each one has their things. Your voice carries really well. So we're not going to touch on that. Um, however, uh, for those of you that do look at my YouTube channels, there's a couple, there's, a cha there's one of my uh, playlists, CST250, that covers about two weeks of that stuff in there for MySQL, if you're curious on how it is and how it works. It's similar, but not quite the same as Postgres. Every server does it differently because they each do the security differently. All right, back to where I was. The SQL language is case insensitive. Object names and data is usually case sensitive. So the language itself is not case sensitive. However, the name of things <laughs> is, and the data is usually case sensitive. Unless you're working on either Microsoft SQL Server, depending what code page you're on, or MySQL, which tries to be special and make everything case insensitive, which makes case sensitive matches really difficult. It's easier to go one way than the other, and they did it the wrong way. Um, so the main part of the language, such as insert, update, create, select, all that is case insensitive. The rest of it is assume it's case sensitive. Um, it uses spaces as keyword delimiters. So remember when I'm talking about you, to you about design and not to put in spaces in your object names? It's because the SQL language uses spaces as its keyword delimiter. So every time you put sees a space, it thinks you're, it's off to the next part of the keyword, that command. And the, the SQL language is very English, like so it looks like sentences, sort of. And the command terminator is a semicolon. Congratulations, you don't need to learn something new on that one. It's the same thing as Java and C, semicolon at the end. All right, DDL is where I'm gonna start. A DDL is made up of three commands. There's create, alter, and drop. You use create to make things, Alter to change them, and drop to get rid of them. You drop it, it's like a hot turd in a bucket. And I will explain to you how dangerous some of these commands are in a bit. Okay, 
So I will be teaching you guys basically what they call the ISO standard, or the ANSI standard SQL. This means I teach you basic SQL with none of the really specific stuff that is server specific as much as humanly possible. Now the syntax is pretty straightforward for your create command. As in pretty straightforward is relatively speaking. The command is create. Then you have to put a space, then you tell it what kind of thing are you creating. Then you have another space. Then you give it the name of the object. Another space and then the definition. And this is where the whole SQL language goes kind of weird. Because depending on what you're creating, the syntax changes on a per object basis. I could literally teach three weeks just the create command. Instead, what I've done is I've provided you guys a handy little link. If you need to look up how to create certain things, you click on the link and you go read the documentation. If you haven't learned how to read online documentation yet, this is a good time to learn. Um, I am going to go pull up that one page though for everybody's enjoyment. And this is for an older version of Postgres. But this is the syntax for the create command. I haven't even hit the comments yet. There we go. Oh, no, there's still more. So, yeah, like I said, there's a lot to the create command. However, what you guys are mostly going to be doing is creating tables and views. And the syntax for those is very short. And this is the abridged syntax for creating a table. So you go create space, table, space. In this case, I'm going to call it test. Open up a bracket. And then it's field name, data type, and any constraints on that field. So ID, big serial, primary key. Congratulations, you made a field that's a primary key. Comma, and then the next line of definition. Comma, next line of definition. Notice there's no comma on the last line. If you put one there, it's going to complain. I'm just going to say you suck. Then you close your bracket and you put in your semicolon and away it goes. And on this example, I'm showing you guys three separate things. I'm showing you how to define the primary key. I show you guys how to set something as not null. If you do not include not null, it means you can null it. And uh, how to set the default. So, yes? Uh, just a little bit just a little bit ahead. What IDE are we going to be using? PG admin. Something else? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Which one? Yeah, I agree. Or you could use also SQL Manager from EMS, which I have a school key for. Oh, I, I just I just like jet brains because like I, I, I think IntelliJ and uh, Python are fantastic. Yeah. I don't care. You do know as a student you get all of it for free, right? Oh, well, no. I mean, just so you know. Okay, the next command is alter. And you use it to change the definition of objects. And when you're working with tables, you can add, rename, remove columns, change the data types, add constraints, remove constraints, all that jazz. And again, the syntax varies dramatically by object. It is, the, it's insanely long, and the syntax. Just for alter table, it's actually very long. Okay. Give me a second. So this is the alter commands, and they're, they're, they all show you all the different ways you can do things on it. The syntax is there. I don't go through it line by line. Like I said, on the DDL, I can spend weeks on just the DDL. Um, essentially, you guys got to learn how to do it, and I will actually be recording some examples for you guys at the end of the class. So, but you wanted me to go through this slide one more time a little slower? The one before it. The one before it. This. So we're talking about the create part of it, the, the actual syntax example. So the video. Not sure what you're asking. Don't worry. Okay. If I don't know what you're asking, I can't I can't answer your question. So All right. Now, again, as, once I'm done going through the slides, I'm actually going to do a quick demo of all the commands. So it's all going to be recorded and hopefully work.
Um, the last command after alter, because there's no point even showing syntax on the slide for alter because it changes per table, I mean per object type. Drop is easy to remember. It's easiest to remember. And it's the same for pretty much everything. It's drop object name. So if you had a table called test, you go space drop test. Gone. And this is where I usually put in my big warning about the SQL language. There's no undo. There's no control Z. It's really, really fast. So it's like driving down the Queensway at 160 with no brakes during rush hour traffic. You're basically dodging everything. And if you make a mistake, um, I've done it accidentally. Nuked the contents of an entire table because I didn't have enough coffee that day and I had a backup from three hours before, thank God. It only took me 20 minutes to recover. But it was a bad day in my world. Drop is dangerous because once you run it and you hit enter and it executes, it's done. There's no going back. <coughs> okay. The next part of the SQL language I'm going to talk about today and demonstrate in a bit is DML. DML is made out of four sort of five commands. There's insert, update, delete, select, and then there's truncate, which is the fifth. Insert lets you put stuff in. I'll be going through that in a bit. Update lets you update the data. Delete obviously deletes the data. Select allows you to pull the data out. So those four commands together are known as CRUD. Create, retrieve, update, delete. It's an old acronym from way back in the day. But it's known as CRUD. And it works pretty good. Um, truncate is like delete. It's, a, it's comparing a pellet gun to a Gatling gun. Uh, truncate is dangerous. Whereas with delete, there's a little delay if it's a big table. You know, deleting a million rows might take a couple of seconds. Truncate will take like a hundredth of a second. What it does is it rewrites the table and marks the entire table as empty. It doesn't actually delete the data out of it. It just marks the whole space as available. You know how in Windows it doesn't make a difference if you delete a 1K file or a 4 gig file because it's just gone? It's not really deleted, right? It just marks the spaces available. Truncate does the same thing. It's pretty lethal. And of course, as I said earlier, every command has different syntax. It's all done differently. It's as if each person was sitting in a different room, not conversing. Now, the insert command looks like this. Insert into table name. You give it a list of val a list of columns, and then you get a list of values. And depending on what the values are going in, it changes. <coughs> I do go through the slides fairly quickly, just so I can um, get down to the demonstration side, which is actually more interesting. Uh, the next one is the update command. And it's update, whatever you're trying to update, you set the field. And you can do multiple fields at once by common delimiting them. And then you put in some where conditions, which we're going to get into where conditions next week. Um, let's just say if you do not include your where clause, it affects everything in that table. So if you want to update somebody's name and you forget to say which person you're trying to update, it'll update everybody if have the same name. Really special. Delete. It's delete from whatever the table is called, where. Always put a where clause on your delete. Otherwise, what are you going to do if you don't include the where clause? You're going to delete everything. And then select. Um, select is the command we're going to spend weeks on. There's an insane amount of syntax. It is the biggest command in SQL by far. It'll do crazy things with your data. It's amazing. You can even use it as a calculator. And considering Postgres understands statistics and has statistics functions, it can actually do your stats homework for you if you know how to run the commands properly. Uh, you can use it to run reports, summarize your data, find users that have been abusing your database, all kinds of cool things. 
And the most basic syntax is select asterisk from whatever table. So that means select all columns from table test in this case. And I'll be creating a test table as my example. So this is the slideshow. Now I'm going to pull up my editor. Wrong one. All right, so as I was saying earlier, I'm going to show you guys the basic syntax. Let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. That's almost legible. And now it's ignoring my keystrokes. So the command to create the table is create table, space, give the name of the object. In this case, it's test because then I'm just going to call it test. And uh, my primary key is going to be called ID because actually I'll make this plural before I get called out on it. And I'm going to make this a big serial. And it's a primary key. So at this point, this is a complete command. I can run this. It will create a single table with one column called ID. It's got a primary key. It uses the big serial data type. Now, as you'll see, as I'm going to mix match by the size of my syntax. Like if I'm going to go uppercase, lowercase, just show you guys that you can. Which one? Because now is a function. It's a function called now. I could alternate. Now works on both Postgres, MySQL. It also works in Oracle and I think in Microsoft SQL Server. If I wanted to make it Postgres specific, I could go instead. And that uses a reserved keyword instead. But it's not as portable. So I try to stick it to being portable. All right. So I'm going to actually make a, have a syntax error. Just show you, I can show you guys what the first error message you're going to all experience. Because pretty much everyone gets this one at the beginning. All right. Syntax error near bracket, line six. So the way the SQL language tells you something's horribly wrong is by telling you the next thing after wherever the mistake is. So it doesn't tell you what the mistake was. It just says, I can't work past this point. Something's gone wrong. So normally when you see this, you want to go look right in front of that and you go, oh, I'm a tool. I have an extra comma. Now if I run it, ta-da. It ran. So now if I were to go There's my table I just created. And there's, if you see, there's ID name, and entry, timestamp, and active. One, two, three, four. 
All right, so that's cool. I created a table. Let's say I want to change my table. I can alter my table and add a column. Again, if I were to come here and refresh that, and everything jumps, of course, email's been added. If I want to get rid of the column, it's drop column. So at the alter table command is alter table, you need to tell it what table you want to update. And then everything after this is what you're actually doing in the table. Uh, you can alter the column and change the data type. You can rename a column. Oh boy, I think I can remember this. Bet you I got this one wrong. No, I got it right. That never happens. Because the syntax is different from MySQL. Basically, everything after this is different on MySQL than it is on Postgres. And it's different than it is on Microsoft SQL Server. Thus, I don't do provide documentation for each of these commands because I don't want to railroad you down a specific set of syntax, but you have to learn it based on what you're working with. So I've renamed this column, and now I'm going to drop that column, and it's gone. So if I refresh this one more time, there you go. My, that email column that I added, renamed, and deleted is gone. Um, I'll be keeping this history for you guys and posting it on Brightspace just so you can try it out yourselves. All right, so I am not going to do the drop table yet because I actually want to put stuff in it. All right, so Right now I'm going to insert into tests. I'm going to add one row of data. Now usually at this point I tend to have um, a few students say, well, aren't you going to supply values for every column? If I had, I will in a minute. However, ID is auto-incrementing. That means it's going to set its own value. Entry timestamp defaults to now. Active defaults to true. Unless you actually want to override the defaults, you do not need to provide any values for it. So I'm going to run this. And there's my one row I inserted. There's Dan. The timestamp is there. Active was true. The ID is included for the ride. If you are using an auto-encrypting primary key, never include the primary key for the ride. Why? Because you're going to break the database's way of keeping track with the next ideas. That's just how it works. Now I'm going to add Dan2. I'm going to run it, and there's Dan2. The timestamp changed just a little bit. As you can see, it's very accurate. You know, that's hundreds of a second, thousands of a second. Ten thousandths of a second, hundred thousandths of a second, mill millionths of a second, whatever this number is at the end here, ten millionths of a second, that's like nanoseconds, just so you know. Um, now, let's say I want to override the active, and I can go active here, and then I can say, So now, because I fed active as false, because I forced the value on false, now you'll see that I set the value to false. And I can also, if I wanted to, So you'll notice a few things here. This varchar field is quoted because it's a string. Notice I'm using single quotes. That is the standard. Other database servers will allow you, allow you to use double quotes, such as Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, MySQL. 
IBM will not. So, but they will all support single quote marks. The Boolean, as you can see, is not quoted. Why? Because true and false are actual values. I could al alternatively put in a zero if I wanted to. That would be accepted. Because what's the difference between true and false? One zero. Same thing. Or I could also make it null. And then my timestamp. Single quoted. Even though it is a timestamp, it understands when you feed it a quoted thing, it, it reads it as a string. Now, Postgres is very forgiving when it comes to dates. It is the most forgiving server you'll ever work with for dates. If I wanted to, I could type that in as October 15th, comma 2018. 12, 10 p.m. And it would accept it. Or I could type in zero, zero, or zero, zero colon one one. You can go 24 hour clock, 12 hour, or the AM PM clock. It'll all work. So I'm going to run this. And here's the run, the, the next row I just created. Down here. As you can see, my timestamp is not as precise because I hand coded it. It's just how it works. Now, the other thing you may have noticed is I fed in my fields in a different order than they appear inside the table. That's okay. The order of the fields is not important as long as the values at this end match up the order of the fields over here. So if I try to switch these two around, so I tried to shove a timestamp into the active field and a boolean into the timestamp field, I'll get something that looks like this. Input syntax for type boolean when they fed a date is invalid. Well, of course it's invalid because it's a boolean. You can't feed it a time. Time is not true or false. So that's the insert. So I'm just going to re-pull this real quick so I can look what's inside. And I'm actually going to run this. A couple of times. Actually, that's really obnoxious. Okay, so now I've created 19 rows. The next one I want to show you guys is the update command. Don't use single double quote marks. All right, so I'm going to update one row, and I'm going to run that, and you'll see that two disappeared. And this is a quirk of Postgres. Postgres is the only one of the few database servers that does this. Two will be right at the end, and it's because of the nature of how Postgres writes data to the database. It's also known for being one of the most resilient database servers on the market. As in, data loss rarely happens, even if the server shits the bed halfway through a transaction. Why is that? The way Postgres works is it'll start the process of updating the row. It'll mark the old row as being dirty, or actually being worked, it's dirty as in being worked on. It'll then write the new row at the end of the table. If it successfully writes that new row at the end of the table, it'll go back to that original version of the row and mark it as clear, uh, cleared out. So what happens for a little while, for you know, thousands of a second, you've got two copies, both of them are in there, but one of them is marked as dirty. So what happens if the server shits the bed and this row was never marked as clean or deleted, it'll actually roll back the last set of transactions so the server always stays consistent. Uh, MySQL, on the other hand, if the power goes out while you're writing to a table, you probably just corrupted your table. There's a reason why MySQL should never be used for financial transactions. That's the big one. Now, so as you can see, Dan G ended up going to the bottom. It's number two, because I just updated it. If I were to update row number four, it'll be at the end. So I'm just showing you guys this, so when you start experimenting, 
and you suddenly discover your data went missing, it's not missing, it just moved. Now, to demonstrate what happens if you don't include the where clause, because you know, it's everybody's favorite thing to experience. Boom, oh, that took 45 milliseconds, and now everybody's Dan G. Do you see an undo button anywhere? I done screwed up? No, there's no undo button. Guess what? You're done now. Why not? Because a database server is not being interacted with by the average end user. They're using an interface to do the work. That's what I was about to ask. So you make it table. It's, it's, uh, you have your building, you have your it's sitting in a headless place, yeah. And so you have to basically make get it out to where the user can use it. Yes. How do you, you don't. You, the user interacts with the database real time, except they're using an application to do it so that they don't have to learn SQL. So what, what produces that, the application? How does that come out in that? Programmers. So someone has to. Do yes. That is why you're learning database now, so that later if you decide to work down the database path and write web. One of the popular ways of inter putting interfaces in front of application nowadays is web-based apps. I have a question. So, back in the days, I used to play Wishcap, and if you join the forums, all the forums have the same exact, uh, 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 like, structure. You know what I'm talking about? Like yeah, yeah. Because the they're all using the same bulletin board system. Sorry? They're all using the same bulletin board system. There's only four or five of them. And there's a set structure that they basically all have to follow, and it's there's only so many ways to re-implement the wheel. So odds are they're all using v either uh, vBulletin yeah. or yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, there's a few others that are actually better, um, but you know they. Easy to use, like it was a bunch of kids when Rootskin died, and the only private service, and like thousands of private services. I assume every kid can do that. Yeah, the, the, the bulletin board servers basically opened up a hosting package. You installed the database into your hosting package and then put up the UI and boom, done. So basically the UI provides an interface for talking to the database server. And that's part of learning <coughs> software development later. Um, but yeah, so update, that's it, it's done. Now, so you see, I've shown you guys how to create a table, change a table, how to add stuff into the database, how to change the stuff in the database, and I'm actually going to alter two columns at the same time. I'll pick 14 at random. So if I go to the bottom, now you'll see that Jan, this guy's name changed to Dan G2 and the active field turned to true. So when you want to modify more than one at a time, you come to limit the columns. Key value, key value, comma separated. Did you have a question? Yeah. What if you had like a lot of data that you wanted to import? Uh, import or update? Import. Uh, there's tools for that. Normally, you take a CSV file and import it using an uh, what they call an ETL tool, an electronic transformation something. I don't remember what L stands for. But yeah, so you'd use a tool to import it and you basically map out each of the, col the columns in the CSV file to a column in the database and it goes. So, um, how would you edit multiple like rows of like, with the ID? Would you use spaces or columns? Okay, hang on. The f if you want to set all the same values? Yeah, like say you want to just change like uh, the active like, default. The, the active to there's the there's a few diff fields. there's a few different ways you can do a several changes to the where clause to handle it, but I'm not going to cover that today. That's actually part of like next week's lecture because okay. you know I can't teach the entire SQL language in one night. Um, uh, yeah, you can you can feed it a list. You can feed it anyone that's not true, make them fall. That make them anything that's not true, make them true kind of thing. There's a bunch of things you can do. Uh, or, you know, you can do that too. Yeah, there's multiple ways of doing it. So, that's if I want to update. <coughs> I 
And if you look at the bottom, the two that I updated will be in the order that they got run. It's pretty straightforward. All right. All right, delete from test where ID is equal to 14. Syntax is straightforward and easy to understand. Whoop. Yep. There's the other message, error message that you're going to discover. Even though it always looks the same error message as you're an idiot, you forgot your semicolon. There it is. So that took 58 milliseconds. In actual fact, this UI is really, really slow. In a regular UI, that'd be about 14 milliseconds. And we can scroll and you can see that 14 used to be here. 14 is no longer here. Now, it is impossible to undo a delete. So once you delete something, it's gone. You got to recreate it and you're not going to have the same ID again. Because it's auto incrementing. 14 is gone. Theoretically, you could reinsert 14 if you wanted to because 14 will never be used again. So you could theoretically reuse 14 manually. I don't recommend ever doing that. I recommend don't delete everything. Make backups first, especially when you do broad changing change, uh, changes. All right, so, and we're of course always going to do this just to show everybody. So that took what, 58 milliseconds to delete one row? 50 milliseconds to delete the entire table. Now there's nothing left. It's all gone. There's no coming back. All right, hang on. Let me go back. Go. No, I'm editing the uh, text editor. It's not undoing, as you can see, it's not undoing what I've done to the database. I am just, I'm just going to recreate a bunch of rows in here. It's a little spazzy. All right. So as you can see, eventually these notifications will go away. It starts at 20 because I was 19 before. It doesn't give me 1 to 19 again. They're gone. So I got 20 to 41. This is so I can demonstrate this command. Also gone. Eh? They never last? Gone before you even realized it? Yeah, go really fast. Go really fast. Um, yeah. So that's basically truncate. Now, it's really hard for me to demonstrate to you guys the speed difference between truncate and delete. Um, specifically because truncate is significantly faster than delete. I just don't have a database that I'm willing to sacrifice, or do I? No, I have no database I'm willing to sacrifice for this. <laughs> so, hey? Because I'm not connecting to my works AWS instance and nuking stuff from there. Um, the database is too big to copy to my local machine, 16 gigs. I don't want that initializing every time I boot my laptop. So, positive. Okay, so that's truncate. Okay, give me a minute, guys. We're almost done. The next one is drop table. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add data again. Oops. I'm going to add data again because, you know. All right, so I've created another bunch of rows. Now I'm going to drop the table. Not only am I emptying the table, it's I'm making it like the table never existed. And I've got an error. Relation test does not exist. Now that's the other error message you guys should get comfortable with. That means you did not create your table properly. And eighty-five milliseconds to drop the table. Now that actually is a lot longer, but it's the difference of emptying out a room and demolishing the room. And when I demolish the room, I'm not even emptying it out first. I'm literally just, everybody's in here, I'm pulling the plug, boom. <coughs> Everything is gone. 
do not pass go, do not collect $200. <laughs> it's over. Okay, so, yeah. So now to recreate this table, I'd have to actually recreate it from scratch. That is the basics of the first set of commands you guys need to learn. You need to know how to insert your data. You need to know how to create or update your data. You need to know how to create a table. Uh, create, alter are the commands you're going to use, and insert are the commands you're going to use for lab six. Everything you need for lab six got demonstrated in the last 20 minutes. Uh, the start of lab seven was demonstrated also today. So theoretically, you guys could start reaching ahead if you wanted to. Um, now, at this point, this is basically what I cover uh, on this lab, because usually at this point in time, everybody's suffering. This is the midpoint of the term, or pretty close to it. And people have already had, you know, oh, God, I had so many tests this week, and I got assignments due, and my ears are bleeding gray matter. So I usually plan in my middle lecture as a short lecture for you guys. So that was literally all I was planning on covering today. So now, does anybody have questions about what I covered quickly? Where are we going to download or get access to this, uh, this uh, PG Admin you have installed. That was part of your install on Monday, on, on, on week one. When I opened it, it said can, could not contact the server. Yeah, yeah, me too. That's because your Postgres server isn't running in the background. Oh, no. Make sure your service is running. I tried, yeah. yeah. My Postgres never opened it. Oh, it takes like a century. Yeah. There are other tools you can use. Um, actually, I'm going to kill the recording because this does not need to be recorded.